All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and read chapter seven and eight of What's His Face? Chapter seven, The Apprentice. Roderick Barnabas Northrop was born on October 23rd, 1582, in Whitechapel, East London, the son of Alastair Northrop, a noted alchemist and an inventor, and Mary Northrop, who took in washing to make ends meet so her husband would be free to pursue his experiments. Mary died of plague when her son was only 11, excuse me, 7. Brokenhearted, Alastair lost himself in his work, and Roddy was left to fend for himself in a poor and sometimes dangerous district of London, outside the protection of the city walls. How come you weren't rich, Cooper interrupts Roddy's account of his life. I thought alchemists could turn other metals into gold. Father was a brilliant alchemist, Roddy says stoutly. Twas he who was first discovered that gold is gold and lead is lead, and no boiling fire nor druid incantation or secret potion changeth that bitter fact. Verily were his achievements so great that he will never be forgotten. I hate to tell you this, Cooper, ventures, but you might be a little wrong about that. There's no Alistair Northrop on Wikipedia. The ghost frowns. Wiki... It's like everything everybody knows about anything, and probably a lot of stuff they're not too sure about. Roddy listens crestfallen. Oh, cruel world to erase the accomplishments of a great inventor merely because his inventions all failed. Cooper tries to be gentle. Well, if his inventions never worked, then what did he really invent? Roddy digs in his heels. Many of the greatest miracles in your world began in father's laboratory. The magnificence of your school bus, Father envisioned a great carriage powered not by horse, but by a force invisible to the eye. He also imagined a magical window. One doth look through the glass and behold not what is on the other side, but another place entirely. Is that not your television? Well, I wouldn't go that far, Cooper begins. And this phone that is my prison, the ghost continues. Is it not merely Father's magical window of a smaller size? So that it may be carried in the hand? Not exactly. So if thy Wikipedia hath forgotten Alistair Northrop, tis because the soldiers and magistrates believed the bubbling cauldrons and many colored flames coming from his laboratory hath created the plague. In their ignorance, they tried him as a warlock, leaving lesser men to complete his greatest projects. A warlock? Cooper echoes. That's bad, right? Very bad, Roddy nods gravely. So bad that I was barred from working with mine own father. I was indentured to Mannering and a Brown as a printer's apprentice. While father stood trial for his life, I could not speak up for him. Mine employers would not have grant me leave to see him before the execution. Shame turns Cooper's cheeks hot. His own complaints, the frequent moves, his stints as the new what's-his-face in his town after town are pretty small compared with what Roddy had to suffer. Losing both parents, a job he hated, and finally the plague, a terrible and painful end. I guess it stank to be a kid in your time, he offers lamely. Alas, if only the unpleasant smell was the worst of it. Roddy tells him, chores that last through the dawn, mountains of paper to daunt Hercules himself, the stain of ink on my hands, my blouse, even my very tongue. And should the slightest comma be out of place, Cruel Mr. Manning would beat me with a bone handle of his walking stick. Sounds like a pretty crummy life. Roddy shakes his head. I had not the bread for crumbs, only a thin soup. Mrs. Mannering made from supper scraps. Those were dark days, Cooper Vega. The agony of hunter rivals, even that of the plague. Many's the time I thought of running away to sea. Yet a sailor once told me there were weevils in the biscuits. A full belly is surely a fine thing but not if that belly is full of weevils. Rodney resumes his story. His apprenticeship in the print shop lasted through 1596. What choice did he have? He was destitute orphan, the son of a disgraced warlock. If not for Mannering and Brown, he surely would have starved. His days began at dawn and stretched far into the night. It was back-breaking work, setting type, cutting the quarto size sheets into individual pages, binding them in a book form, Mr. Mannering was a harsh employer, never sparing with his bone-handled walking stick, especially when he would stagger back into the shop after a meal that consisted mostly of wine. I'll throw thee out on the street, vile son of a sorcerer, he would spit at Roddy. Thou wouldst rot in the gutter if not for my kindness. 
Roddy knew kindness had nothing to do with it. Mannering needed this thin fingers which were deft with a tiny type of printing press. His small hands and the fact that Alistair Northrop had taught his son the rare skills of reading and writing made Roddy the perfect apprentice in those days. While his employer was in the tavern, Roddy eagerly read through the shop's freshly bound books. In those days, the London theater scene was booming, so most of Mannering and Brown's publications were plays. Alistair was too wrapped up in his work to be a theater fan, but a few years before, while the lab was being rebuilt after a small explosion, he had taken his son to the performing of Tamburlaine the Great. It was the most memorable experience of Roddy's life. In the print shop, he never missed a chance to talk to the playwrights who came in to oversee the publication of their, por of their folios. That became Roddy Roddy's plan, his obsession, his past out of this dreary and miserable life. He'd become a famous playwright. That's pretty cool, Cooper tells him. Alas, was not to be, Roddy sighs. The chills came first, then the sweats, and by the time Mr. Manning brought the surgeon, the dreaded bubbles had appeared, lumps the size of hen eggs. I was to share the fate of my poor mother, long in the grave. I guess it was pretty awful, Cooper puts in. The ghost is stingingly sarcastic. Of the plague we speak, not of mortified toe, yeah, verily, it was awful. My memory is such much suffering, then less than none, and finally of thee. The passage of centuries I remember not. Or what you're doing in my phone, Cooper adds. This I have pondered greatly, Roddy says. Why am I come to thy world and not allowed to rest as others of my time? I, be I believe I'm here to serve a high and noble purpose. What purpose, Cooper asked breathlessly. This could be important. If he knows why the ghost is on the phone in the first place, maybe he can figure out what to do next. To clear my father's name and restore his stature as an inventor, Roddy announces grandly. Oh yeah, Cooper is aware of a letdown. That. Dost thou not see the ghost demands a great task has been left undone? I would wager my very own life on it and had I still a life to wager. Well, maybe, Cooper concedes grudgingly. It was sure sounds like Alistair Northdrop was a terrible inventor and an even worse alchemist with no reputation to save. But how could he save that to Roddy, who has suffered enough? Just keep an open mind, okay? We don't want to get locked down into only one theory. All at once, Roddy's eyes widen in alarm. Oh, Cooper Vega, I am unwell. I tremble. Cooper's alarmed. That can't happen, can it? Ghosts can't get sick. They're already dead. It is the plague, Roddy insists. First the weakness, then the fever. I remember it too well. Oh, cruel fate that I should die of it twice. The screen flickers and Cooper flinches, as if the phone really does carry bubonic plague. That's when he notices the power indicator in the top corner. 2%. Roddy, you don't have the plague. You have low battery. Oh, wicked world, Roddy moans. To come back from the plague only to succumb to a low battery. Low battery isn't a disease. It's, forget it. There's no describing it to someone from a time before electricity. Where did I put my charger? I need no charger. The ghost flickers again and his face suffused with panic. Fetch me leeches to bleed the low battery distemper from my body. <laughs> Cooper races around his room looking for papers and books underneath and excuse me looking under papers and books and opening drawers in search of the gx 4000's cable a chime comes from on the phone as the low power warning blocks out roddy's tormented face i hear the tolling of the bells farewell cooper vega thou art a good friend thou canst not save me the screen goes blank roddy cooper yanks the cable out from under a wadded up t-shirt leaps onto his bed where the darkened phone lies he jams one end into the port and another into the wall. Too late. The logo appears as the GX4000 begins to reboot. Cooper is stricken with guilt. He was so wrapped up in Roddy's life story that he's carelessly let the phone run out of juice. What if he can't find him again? What if Roddy's spear travels to somebody else's phone? Worse, what if the ghost is lost forever? Sorry, Roddy, he mumbles aloud. No need for sorrow comes a jubilant voice from the phone. The reboot finishes and the home screen reappears to be replaced a moment later by the image of Roddy, grinning from ear to ear. Thou art a brilliant physician, Cooper Vega. I, much re I am much restored by your ministering without leeches. Thou shouldst become a barber so great are thy skills. Cooper smiles in spite of himself and on some level he understands that being haunted is no cause for celebration. But Roddy's more than a ghost. He's turning out to be kind of a friend. 
Friends aren't easy to come by when you move to a new town every time the wind blows. Chapter 8. They call him the Bard. Jolie's mode of transportation to school the next day is by skateboard. And, of course, she's an expert. She's just a blur as she flashes by Cooper. Recognizing him, she vaults up onto a low railing, leaps into a 180, hits the pavement into a spin, and glides to his side. Her t-shirt depicts a lifeguard grappling with prehistoric monster. Above the caption, Loch Ness Beach Patrol. Hi, Cooper. Cooper awards her a round of applause. Zounds, Roddy exclamations through the earbud, confirms he's noticed her from the GX4000. She doth move like a queen of fairies. Cooper drops his phone onto his pocket, casting Roddy into the dark. Nice skateboard, he tells Julie. A snort comes from the earbud. In the presence of such beauty, thou respondeth thus for shame, Cooper Vega. I had to sneak out the back door so my dad wouldn't see me, Julie admits. I mean, I wear a helmet. Get over your helicopter parenting. Not that he'd ever be cool enough to let me go on a helicopter. Speak these words to her. Rowdy advises in a confident confidential tone. Say, neither helmet nor veil should be permitted to cover thy loveliness. I like your helmet, Cooper says. It looks really protective. Roddy's incensed. That is not what I told thee to say. Brock flashes by on his bike. Looking good, Jolie. Wait up, Brock. She sails off after him on a skateboard. Let's go check the bulletin board at school. The castle is for Romeo and Juliet. It's going up today. Bye, Jolie, Cooper calls, but she and Brock are already gone, leaving him standing alone. Well, almost alone. Explain thyself, Roddy demands through the earbud. Why dost thou not speak my words to beauteous Jolie? Nobody talks that way anymore, Roddy, and nobody says beauteous either. If I said that, I'd sound like an idiot. Tis better to appear fool than to become one and let a fair maiden slip through thy fingers. Not since my beloved Ursula have I beheld her equal. Cooper takes the GX4000 out of his pocket as he resumes the walk to school. Who's Ursula? The ghost's face turns tragic. Only the best closest glimpse of heaven on this sad earth. The daughter of my employer, Rupert Manning. Alas, the attentions of such angel were beyond my miserable grasp. Cooper can't resist being sarcastic. Why don't you just tell her neither helmet nor veil? Mock me not, Cooper Vega. Cruelty ill becometh thee. I just figured, you know, since it's so obvious to you what I should say. The penniless son of a condemned sorcerer cannot pretend to the, to the hand of the daughter of his employer. Roddy interrupts. But thine advantages are beyond counting. Thine ovens cook without fire. Thy chamber pots need never be emptied outdoors. All manner of entertainments appear on magical win windows large and small throughout thy grand dwelling. When thou strollest in the streets, not a single dead body must thou step over. Thou art high in dignity, Cooper Vega, while worthy of Jolie's love. It brings a smile to Cooper's lips. He walks a little taller. He may be the town what's-his-face, but at least if one person considers him high in dignity. One ghost, anyway. Thanks, Roddy, but you have to understand the way things are now. If I go up to Jolie and start talking about beauty and angels and love, she'll dial 911. Kids don't say stuff like that to each other. Roddy looks bewildered. And what manner of stuff might young lovers say to one another? Cooper shrugs. I don't know. You mentioned what you kind of like someone or maybe that she's hot or whatever. Hot? The ghost is alarmed. This is a sign of the plague. Say not so of fair Jolie. She's fine, Cooper assures him. It's just that nobody says all that mushy, flowery stuff anymore. We leave that to Shakespeare. Shakespeare? Roddy is suddenly alert. Thou speakest of William Shakespeare? Short of stature, ridiculous mustache? What knowest thou of him? Cooper stops walking. Wait, are you telling me you met the real Shakespeare? Many playwrights visited the shop of Mannering and Brown whilst their folios were being printed, the ghost explains. Marlowe, Kidd, Johnson, Shakespeare styled himself a member of this group, though he had not the wit to become their equal. Brace yourself, Roddy. In 2018, people consider Shakespeare the greatest writer of all time. This must be a jest. Shakespeare were a mere actor who fancied himself a playwright. Cooper shakes his head. No jest. He's the real deal. They call him the Bard. Like you don't even need his name to know him. it's him. Roddy's in true pain. Such a cruel fate that my brilliant father should be so forgotten. 
whilst the clod, like William Shakespeare, winneth such everlasting renown that his work is remembered centuries after the end of his colorless life. It's true, Cooper tells him. We're doing a Shakespeare play in seventh grade. I'll show you the script. Everybody talks just like you. Maybe you can tell me what it means. He slips the GX4000 into his pocket as he enters the school building. The foyer is packed with kids milling around the bulletin board outside the main office. Excited chatter fills the air. Just as Cooper reaches the back of the group, a delighted squeal goes up in the crowd. I did it, Jolie cries joyfully. I got Juliet. There are congratulations from the boys on the scene and some less enthusiastic from the girls. With Jolie snagging the lead, they're left with the lesser roles. Congratulations, Jolie, Cooper calls. Never any doubt. Thanks, Cooper. Well said, Rowdy approves via the earbud. Cooper works his way through the crowd, inching toward the po posted cast list. He's almost at the front when a large elbow muscles him out of line. Big star coming through, Brock rumbles loudly. Oh, hey, it's What's-His-Face. Check it out. He waves his phone at Cooper and presses a button. A cartoon face appears on the screen and barks. You're a jerk, the biggest. I got an insult app too, Brock steers, and mine's better. If you pay extra, you get curse words. His sausage-like fingers ascend the posted list of names from the bottom, coming to the rest at the very top. Ha, I'm Romeo. Naturally, he struts off bellowing. Hey, Julie, guess what? Buffoon, comes a disgusted voice through the earbud. Cooper scans down the list, heart sinking as all the de decent parts go to the seventh graders. Finally, there he is, the next to last name on the page. Second Watchman, Cooper Vega. Unbelievable, he thinks bitterly. While Brock is working cheek to cheek with Joel Lee, playing the most romantic star-crossed lovers ever, Cooper gets a part that doesn't even have a name. What's-His-Face has been cast as a What's-His-Face. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and read chapter nine. Just your luck. All right, chapter nine. Greatest story, greatest love story ever told. Second Watchman has only one line. It comes in scene three of the very last act. In other words, the play is nearly over before Cooper even gets to set, step on stage and say, here's Romeo's man. We found him in the churchyard. He hasn't memorized with 10 seconds of reading it in the script. Now what's he supposed to do for the six weeks of rehearsal? The answer soon becomes clear. He's expected to twiddle his thumbs while waiting for the chance to deliver his line. This is to begin right after school on the very day that the class list is posted. Dost thou believe thou art hard done by? Roddy demands. Tis I who must listen to the moldy words of that half wit Shakespeare whilst my father lies forgotten in the midst of time. I could always turn my phone off, Cooper offers. Then you wouldn't have to listen to anything. Thou dost not dare, the ghost exclaims. I shall hear with mine own ears the dross that droppeth from the quill of this bard of time. Yeah, well, though thine own ears are going to have to wait. Mom's taking Veronica and me for flu shots this afternoon, so we'll miss the first hour of rehearsal. Flu? It's kind of a disease, kind of like the plague, but without the oozing it eruptions. The shot keeps you from getting sick. They stick a needle in your arm. Speak not of needles, Roddy protests. In the print shop, I stitch folios until my poor fingers bled, while fair Ursula braided ribbons in her hair indifferent to my suffering. Fair Ursula isn't what worries Cooper. Fair Jolie is on his mind, mainly the tender love scene she and Brock have to perform together. In a play like Romeo and Juliet, if you take out the romantic stuff, you're basically left with the end. Cooper has to worry. What if Jolie gets so into character pretending to love Brock that she starts liking him for real? She talks all the time about how a true actress has to live her role. And for her, acting is the most, almost as important as base jumping and wrestling alligators. Sure enough, when Cooper finally gets to rehearsal, that afternoon his arm is still throbbing from the flu shot. Jolie and Brock are side by side and the entire cast sits on folding chairs arranged in a huge circle in the gym, reading from their scripts. Romeo and Juliet are saying goodbye to each other in act two and the two lead characters, excuse me, actors, are practically cheek to cheek. Only one empty chair beckons and it's obvious for the second watchman. Cooper has to cross half the gym to reach it and as he does, his shoes squeak loudly, dissolving the entire rehearsal into giggles. 
Jolie breaks out of character, looking annoyed. Don't sweat it, Brock soothes. It's just what's-his-face. Cooper slides into his seat, red face with humiliation. Nice of you to join us, Mr. Marchese says in exasperation. All right, let's keep going. I believe Juliet was speaking. Jolie peers deeply into Brock's eyes and says, Good night, good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Watching this is pure torture for Cooper. But what happens next made him forget his agony. As Jolie continues Juliet's speech, Roddy says it over the earbud right along with her. That I shall say good night till be more morrow. Huh? How can Roddy know those words? He said he never read any of Shakespeare's writing. He had no idea the guy ever got famous. Brock comes in next, tripping over Romeo's lines. Sleep dwell upon thy eyes, peace in thy breast. Would I were sleep and peace so sweet to rest. To Cooper's astonishment, the ghost recites these two word for word. It doesn't make sense. Shakespeare wasn't Shakespeare yet when we hung around Mannering and Brown's print shop in the 1590s. He was a newbie breaking into the playwright business. Yet here's Roddy rattling off chunks of Romeo and Juliet as if they had them memorized. Roddy, Cooper hisses. Roddy continues to reel off Romeo's speech. He's better than Brock because the 16th century language comes naturally to him. But Brock is reading it straight from the script in his lap. Where's the ghost getting it? Roddy, what are you doing? Sorry, Brock. I have to stop you there, Mr. Marchi stands up and turns cold eyes on Cooper. I don't know what it says in your script, Cooper, but in mine, the second watchman doesn't come until Act 5. Uh, yeah, Cooper manages. I had to get a flu shot, so I missed the beginning, and I guess I got confused. The director motions him towards the door. Relax. Catch your breath. Take as long as you need. But when you rejoin the circle, I expect you to behave as a full member of this cast. Right. Cooper flees the gym, trying to ignore the scattered laughter and jeers that follow him to the exit. Once in the hall, he whips the GX4000 out of his pocket and watches as Roddy's image stabilizes. What's going on, man? Our play. How do you know it? Know it? The ghost repeats. Cooper Vega, I wrote it. Cooper just stares. This I have told thee. I looked upon the playwrights in the print shop, and thou what wit hath they have, I have not. I would, I would write a play of equal quality to the likes of Marlowe or Kidd. Only the plague could stop me, and stop me it did when my final acts were not complete. Roddy, what are you saying? The words of Fair Jolie and the bumbling buffoon, they are my words. You're lying, Cooper accuses. Romeo and Juliet was written by William Shakespeare. I know not this Romeo and Juliet, Roddy returns stoutly. My play is Barnabas and Ursula. As thou knowest, Barnabas is my second Christian name. Ursula is the love beyond my reach. My story was of we two, star-crossed lovers separated by circumstance. I wrote on scraps of paper in the print shop. When at last my labors were finished, all whilst your Shakespeare slept or sat on his worthless rump, chatting with Marlowe and Kidd and others of his betters. It's totally impossible, Cooper's mind screams. Ridiculous. Everybody knows Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. And yet, at the same time, it's so easy to believe Roddy, the young apprentice slaving away on his masterpiece while the more accomplished writers watched their plays coming off the printing press. And when poor Roddy died, Roddy, Cooper's voice is hushed. Where did you keep Barnabas and Ursula when you weren't working on it? Alas, I could not allow Mr. Mannering to learn of my manuscript, the ghost replies. I had to hide it under my mattress in the corner of the shop. Even scraps of paper were too costly for the likes of an apprentice. Why dost thou ask? You don't think, Cooper takes a breath. I mean, what if Shakespeare saw you writing a play? When you died, he searched your things, found Barnabas and Ursula, changed the names, and took it for his own. Roddy is round-eyed. Would that... Would that the rough around this thieving neck has strangled the life from his worthless body? Did that snake believe that ridiculous names like Romeo and Juliet would conceal his crime? What other of my creations did he unmake? The setting of fair born mouth may hap. Fair Verona, Cooper supplies apologetically. That knave! Shakespeare stole my play. You didn't write any others, did you? Cooper asks anxiously. You know, Hamlet, The Tempest, and Midsummer Night's Dream. Are you the real bard and Shakespeare just stole all your stuff? He must have pilfered those plays from other writers. Perchance he have penned one or two of his own. 
A, tea a teaspoonful of talent he surely had, for he completed Barnabas and Ursula before cl claiming it as his own work. Romeo and Juliet is one of the most successful plays ever, Cooper raves. I'll bet every minute of every day it's being read or performed somewhere. Dude, you're a rock star. The ghost is bitter. If it be thy meaning that my achievement is recognized only by rocks, then I agree with thee. I am doomed to be overlooked and forgotten along with my poor father. And I beseech thee, Cooper Vega, speak not thy false title, Romeo and Juliet. It is Barnabas and Ursula. As Shakespeare might have said, forsooth, or maybe that was Roddy's words too. Shakespeare never said anything at all. Cooper can't be sure what's true anymore. The cast gets as far as Act 3 and breaks for the day. That's not good enough for Roddy, though. The ghost demands to know the ending. How did Shakespeare conclude the great romance Roddy never lived to finish? I'm not sure, Cooper tells him, but I think it's kind of sad. The full title is The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Tragedy? Roddy's aghast. How can this be? Tis a beautiful tale of young love. That night, the two go through the script together, Cooper holding the GX4000 over each page so his companion can read along with him. As the direction of the story comes clearer, the ghost's agitation grows. Forced to marry someone she does not love, Juliet comes up with the idea to fake her own death. But the letter explaining the plan to Romeo never reaches him. When she sees Juliet's lifeless body, he's so devastated that he kills himself by drinking poison. Just then she wakes up, finds him dead, and stabs herself with the knife. The end. A mournful wailing comes from the GX4000. William Shakespeare, thou art a monster. Thou hast taken my poetry and turned it into a massacre. We, where, were we two not dead? I should murder thee for his crime. Shh, not so loud, Cooper hisses. If my dad hears you, we've both got a lot of explaining to do. Especially me. I care not. Barnabas, an extension of mine own self and beloved Ursula, both lying dead because of a mere misunderstanding. Shakespeare, thou art the worst writer world hath ever known. Well, how were you going to end it? Cooper asks. Not with death of a certainty. Love, joy, harmony. The two warring families would resolve their grievances and come together to assure the happiness of their children. Pretty different, Cooper admits. Not merely different, better. Fair Ursula could never love me because I was beneath her. So I craft a story to show the world that star-crossed love is a beautiful thing. Thou dost not understand this well, Cooper Vega, through my unfilled love of Jolie. Whoa, Cooper is defensive. Love is a pretty strong word. I mean, I like her, sure, who wouldn't? But nobody in seventh grade talks about falling in love. We're like 12. Ursula had 13 years, Roddy informs her. Even vile Shakespeare changed this knot, though he made a dog's breakfast of most else. This true that Jolie is not of higher station than thee? She kind of is, Cooper interrupts glumly. She's one of the cool people. Roddy seems confused. Art thou not cool? Cooper sighs. There are cool people, and then there are what's-his-faces. I'm so nothing in I'm so nothing in that school that nobody can even remember my name. The ghost is suddenly angry. Now I must pity thee, thou who dwellest with two living parents in a city where there is no plague and the chamber pots empty themselves. Oh, I weep for thee, except I have no tears, as I am a spirit. Something else thou art not. Okay, I get the picture, Cooper says, embarrassed. You're right. I have nothing to complain about. On the small screen, Roddy features Harden into a look of determination beneath his strange cap. Thou shalt become cool, Cooper Vega. Fair Jolie shall like thee back as thou likest her. Mine Ursula may be long dead, but we shall prove that Starcross love is not impossible. No offense, Roddy, Cooper tells him. But how's that supposed to happen? You're stuck in a phone. And besides, you're more than 400 years out of date. You have no clue how the modern world works. This may be so, the ghost says smugly, but thou forgettest one thing. I am the author of the greatest love story ever told. If anyone can help thee, tis I. All right, so that was chapters seven, eight, and nine.